Uh, Mary Smith is our speaker tonight, and she is the curator of the um, Lichterman Nature Center Wildlife Center. Uh, she's been working and engaging with nature since she was a child, leading her siblings on hikes through the forest and creeks surrounding her child, her home. She has a bachelor's degree in biology and biodiversity, as it has been interpreting and caring for native plants and animals for over 15 years. She's worked for the city, county, and state governments, as well as nonprofit organizations, focusing on connecting people with nature. She's been the back, uh, well, I've already told you, she's the curator since 2013 at Lichterman the Wildlife Center. In her free time, she enjoys birding, gardening, and spending time outdoors with her husband and daughter, Mary Smith. Okay, welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, hopefully that will all go well. And I've got a little PowerPoint presentation for you guys. And what I'm gonna talk about today is um, how to attract birds to your yard. And I know you guys are all gardeners, so it's already probably happening in your yard. But what I'm gonna try to do is maybe introduce you guys to some birds that are coming and then give you some, maybe some tips on how to attract some new ones. Um, so if you have questions, um, I think the best way to do that is maybe type them into the chat and I have that pulled up on my screen so I can kind of answer them as we're going and then I'll definitely answer them um, at the end if I don't get to them during my presentation. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen and if uh, everybody wants to stay muted and then we'll just type in questions and um, we'll go from there. If that sounds good. All right, let's see if we can get this to work here. It should be working now, Mary. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so backyard birds. So um, you guys can all see my PowerPoint, right? Yes. Yeah. That's so weird. I can still see my face on there, but um, okay. So, uh, so yeah. So what we're going to talk about today is basically introducing you to some of the birds that you're seeing um, in your backyard and kind of giving them names if you don't know their names, and then also giving you some tips on how to attract more birds. Um, so. Although I hope to teach you guys a, a few birds um, during this presentation, it isn't necessarily a presentation on how to start identifying birds. So that's kind of a whole nother presentation that um, perhaps some of you have seen. Um, hopefully I'll be giving it again in January. Um, but there is a process if you're kind of looking into getting into identifying birds. Um, it's something that during this whole um, quarantine, a lot of people are getting more into just seeing the birds that are coming into their yard. So well, there is a process of doing that and it kind of starts with looking at the size, shape, color, uh, behavior, where you're seeing birds. And so that's a whole process I'm not really going to get into today, but if that's something you're interested in, um, Hopefully I'll be doing another presentation um, this January uh, at Lichterman Nature Center that will kind of go into some of that as well. Um, so that being said, I always like to start with people um, with the birds that you probably already know, right? Like a cardinal, blue jays. Um, I had a really interesting thing this morning. I went outside to um, top off my bird feeders and uh, I saw a Cooper's hawk, which is kind of a resident bird around my house. And he grabbed a young blue jay that had been visiting the feeders. So um, blue jays came in with force and um, the blue jay got away, but it was just really interesting to see. Um, so blue jays, really interesting birds. We'll talk a little bit more about them later. Um, Ruby-throated hummingbirds, that's the mainly the hummingbird that we get here. There's a few vagrants that kind of show up on occasion, but ruby-throated hummingbirds, the majority of the time, the hummingbird that you're seeing east of the Rockies um, okay. here in Tennessee is going to be the ruby-throated hummingbird. American crows, um, I know a lot of people aren't big fans of these birds, but um, I studied ornithology for my master's and they're really intelligent birds, really interesting social birds. So I always like to kind of give them a mention. They get a, a little bit of a bad rap, but pretty interesting birds around here. Um, we also get fish crows. So if you hear a bird that kind of sounds like a sick crow, like a ah, ah, 
Um, it's a fish crown, and um, they are fairly common here in Memphis as well. At Lickerman Nature Center, when the turtles start to come out laying their eggs, we always have fish crows show up and start to dig up those nests and eat the turtle eggs. American robin or robin redbreast, that's a bird you're gonna see year round here um, in the Mid-South, but not always the same ones. They're what we call short distance migrators. So um, sometimes the ones we're seeing in the summertime are not always the ones we're seeing in the winter time. And then of course an Eastern bluebird, which I know is a favorite bird for non-birders. And these guys are really interesting and there are some things that we can do to increase their populations. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So if you want to get into birds, um, what do you need to get started? And really you just need one of your senses. And um, I, I say that because I have a dear friend who is blind and he is an amazing birder and he only uses um, sound for identifying birds. So if you have sight um, or the ability to hear one of those senses, you can get started birding. Um, if you want to get a little bit more into it, there are kind of some tools of the trade. And the first one is probably going to be a field guide. There's a lot of different field guides out there. So take a look kind of what your preference might be. There's ones that have photographs versus drawings. I prefer the drawings because photographs just show one bird at one moment. So drawings kind of give you an overview of that. There's also something in Shelby County um, called the Seasonal Abundance Guide and through our Ornithological Society, which is our bird group, um, they have a Seasonal Abundance Guide on their website. So basically you can see what birds um, are around during certain times of the year. Binoculars can be something else that can really be interesting for birding because as I talk about some of the birds, looking at them a little bit closer through binoculars, you really kind of see them in a different way. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, patience and persistence. And um, I should put one more P in there and that's practice. Just like anything else in life, if you want to get better at identifying birds, you have to practice at it. So, um, and we'll talk about some of the things that you can do to get better at birding as well. And then kind of what's going to be the bulk of this presentation is um, talking about uh, plants to attract birds and then also feeders and some tips and tricks for what type of feeder and to attract different types of birds. Binoculars, real quick over binoculars. Um, the main thing I want to tell you guys about binoculars is when you look at a pair of binoculars, there's going to be two numbers on those binoculars. The first one is usually a number below uh, 12, and that's going to be your magnification or how hot, uh, how magnified the image is. And so if it's a six is the first number, it means what you're seeing is magnified six times versus a 10, which is 10 times. Um, and the second number is the diameter of this part of your binocular down here. And so that's basically going to be letting in more light. Um, but as you get bigger diameters, your binoculars get heavier, um, higher magnifications, you can, um, your images uh, or your, what we call your field of view is a lot less. So what I really recommend for people and what I use the majority of the time is something around an eight by 32 or an eight by 42. So if you have a pair of binoculars, um, take a look at that number and it might make a little bit more sense now that you know what those numbers mean. But let's get to what I call the likely suspects or the birds that you're most likely to see in your backyard. But keep in mind there's some seasonal variation. So there's birds that are here in the winter time and there are birds that are here just during migration and some birds that are here year round. So keep in mind, these are not the only birds you're gonna see in your backyard, but these are kind of the usual or the likely suspects that we see in our backyards in the Mid-South. When I talk about some of these individual birds, I'm gonna go through a list of maybe like 10 or 15 um, common backyard birds. I might mention the word field marks. And basically what a field mark is, is like a, a clue um, to what that bird specifically is. And so I might talk about something like um, it has a white eyebrow stripe and that's something called a field mark. And so if I use the word the field marks to look for, um, those are some of the things that I'm talking about. One bird I always encourage people to look up in their field guide or look up in, um, online to start kind of learning those field marks 
is a fairly common bird that's here in the winter time and that's a white-throated sparrow. It's what most field guides actually use for um, this drawing here to show all those different types of field marks and it's a bird that's fairly common like I said as a feeder bird um, in the winter time and I'll tell you what the sound I have um, this bird I think coming up in a later slide and I'll I'll let you um, hear his sound too, which is pretty unique, but um, this is a white-throated sparrow and it's definitely one if you want to get more into identifying birds, that's a bird that you want to um, take a look at in your field guide. Morning dove, this is probably one that people are pretty familiar with. Um, it's morning like sad, not morning like time of day, and it's um, based on what their sound is like. So that cooing sound is kind of like a sad sound, so that's how they get the name morning dove. When we get into feeding birds, we're gonna talk about um, not all birds are gonna to come to a bird feeder, but morning doves are ones that we see around feeders because they're ground feeders. So if you sprinkle some seed on the ground or these birds tend to like millet spread out on the ground, you're gonna attract some morning doves. Another bird that's been showing up in our area is actually an introduced species called a Eurasian collar dove. And so it looks very similar to a morning dove, but larger and has this black collar on it. Um, and they uh, kind of sound, like I mentioned, the fish crow kind of sounds like a sick crow. They kind of sound like um, sick morning doves, but they're actually, their population is definitely increasing here in the Mid-South, especially in neighborhoods. So um, I've been here about six years. I, I used to see one or two, and now I'm seeing about seven or eight um, in my neighborhood. Carolina chickadees, this is a, a bird, this is one of the birds I did my uh, master's research on, so kind of near and dear to my heart, but they're really energetic birds and active foragers. Um, on the intelligence level of birds, kind of crows are first and chickadees are um, just right below that. Um, a lot of times you'll see them in, bear, in pairs or small groups. And there was a study that came out not too long ago, which I found really interesting. They found that chickadees actually um, pick out the heaviest seeds when they're at a bird feeder. You might see them pick out a seed and drop it and then pick out another seed. And they found that they're actually weighing the seeds because if you're getting a really light seed, it could be one of those duds that doesn't have a seed or the seed is dried out or something like that. So, um, so pretty interesting about Carolina chickadees. And if you look in a field guide, a lot of times people will call me and say, I've got a black capped chickadee um, in my yard. And the reason we don't have black capped chickadees here, um, although they look nearly identical, um, is because of location. So black capped chickadees are a more northern species. The only place in Tennessee you could potentially see them is some of the mountaintops in eastern Tennessee. So Carolina chickadees, that's a chickadee we have around here, um, even though they look very similar to black capped chickadees. And they say their name too, so um, you're probably kind of familiar with that bird and, and the sound that they make as well. A tufted titmouse is kind of a relative to the uh, chickadee and they have kind of this peter 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 call. They're a little bit more shy at the feeder, but they are a fairly common feeder. And what you really look for with these um, birds is this crest. Um, here, similar to like a cardinal crest, but these birds are smaller and gray. And sometimes right along under their wing, you'll see kind of a reddish or a buffy color too. They're here year round and they visit feeders year round as well. White-breasted nuthatch is a pretty interesting bird. A lot of times people confuse them for woodpeckers because of their habit to cling to trees. And they have a longer bill for um, actually stashing and storing seeds under little pieces of bark. Um, but let's see if this works. They have a pretty funny call, um, pretty distinctive call. Let's see. Can you hear that, Chris? Okay, awesome. Um, thank you. So um, yeah, so white-breasted nuthatch is another common one. Still hear that? <laughs> um, so uh, really interesting bird and um, two Two winters ago, we had this other nuthatch show up, which is a red-breasted nuthatch. This is really interesting and kind of interesting in, in the birding world too. Um, every so often we have what we call eruptive years where pine crops um, aren't great up north. So a lot of these northern birds move south. And the red-breasted nuthatch two winters ago 
um, were everywhere and really common. And um, I had them in my backyard um, for, for a while. And um, so that's another bird that sometimes shows up. Uh, last winter, I did not see or hear a single one, but two winters ago, they were every day in the winter time we were seeing or hearing them. Carolina wren, um, these birds are really, if you spend any time outside, you've probably encountered one. They love to nest around people, including um, inside of flower pots, but also um, I remember one day I had a folding chair on my porch and um, we folded it up when we went in for the night and the next evening we went out and they had already built a little nest inside of that chair. Um, so they are really um, built in pretty unique places. Um, they're also known to build like dummy nests. So if they find a spot that's kind of good but not exactly what they want, they'll put a few sticks in there to discourage anyone else from nesting around them. And they'll come to feeders. They're also interesting because they will stick um, together as pairs year round. A lot of, most birds are just gonna pair up in the winter time, um, but, or I'm sorry, in the springtime and summertime, but these guys are gonna stick around year round. And this call um, is somewhat familiar. It's a tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle. who's kind of that call done like in a series of three. The field mark you wanna look for um, in this bird is this white eye line. So this white line just above the eye. House finches, this is another common bird. These birds actually are, are newer to our bird landscape. Um, just been around maybe the last 50 or so years. It was an introduced species into the pet trade. Um, so hence the name house finch but they weren't that popular. So they released them um, and they have since kind of established across the Eastern United States and um, throughout the West as well. So they're a common bird um, year round feeder. Right now they're foraging in small groups with a lot of young with them. Uh, the females have a lot of um, streaking or stripes on their chest and the males have got kind of this reddish head that extends down its throat into um, onto part of their breast. Um, their sound is um, pretty like kind of bubbly and cheery. So I'll play that for you real quick, which is why they thought they would make um, good house pets. Oops, let me go back here. here. Well, it's a pretty cheery, bubbly sound that um, people might want in their house. Um, but in the wintertime, just like the red-breasted nuthatch we talked about a few slides ago, sometimes we can get a bird called a purple finch, and they look really similar. Almost every, every couple years, um, I'll get somebody call me and say, I've got a purple finch that is nesting in my yard. Well, I will tell you, purple finches have never nested in the state of Tennessee. It's not been ever documented. Um, and the reason people think that is because it's actually the house finches. Most pictures don't do them justice. They can be really bright and rosy, um, but the purple finches, the best way to tell these birds apart is the purple finch has got, in the male it's pretty light, but you can see this lighter eye line that goes through here, but in the females it's a lot more distinct. And this is a bird you're just going to see in the winter time. So year round, most of the time, even in the winter time, what you're seeing is going to be the house finch. American goldfinches, these are really, when you see a bright yellow um, bird, this is usually the American goldfinch. Um, and, but they can vary in color depending on what time of year it is. So this is a female, um, or also this is what the males look like in the winter time. I find them a little bit challenging to identify in the winter time too, because they don't have this bright contrasting yellow and black. Like sealer colors, right, Chris? <laughs> Chris and I are both big Steeler fans, so. Um, House Sparrow is another, this is an introduced bird um, as well. And so like their name says, they like to be around people, like to be around houses. Um, and they were all, almost always found in association with humans. And the male has got this um, black, what we call a bib. So just like a baby wears a bib, he's got kind of this black um, patch right under his chin. The females, I like to say they're kind of nondescript. They're like that general brown little bird, brown little sparrow that you see. Starlings, oh, and when I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit about bird seeds and bird feeders, and there's a way actually to discourage those birds from coming to your yard and eating all your bird seed. 
Um, European starlings, this is another introduced species that kind of was introduced for a pretty interesting reason. Um, in New York City, um, in Central Park, there was a uh, Shakespeare group and they wanted to have every bird that was mentioned in a Shakespeare play in Central Park. And so starlings are mentioned um, in one of uh, Shakespeare's plays. And so they introduced starlings and it didn't take the first time, so they tried again. <laughs> well, it worked the second time. And within just like 30 to 35 years, those birds had spread across um, to California. So definitely an introduced species. They're kind of um, a little bit of a bully bird. They can um, outcompete some of our native birds for nesting sites. Um, but they're actually, if you look at them, um, especially the young birds um, in a fresh molt, they've got these neat little um, specks on them. If you look at them really close in a fresh molt, they actually look like little stars. And so that's how they get the name starling. And another interesting feature about them, and, and next time you see a starling, see what color its bill is. Um, their bill changes color in the wintertime um, from the summertime. So in the wintertime, it's, it's dark black. In the summertime, it's yellow. And probably the reason for that is it's probably an indication of health. How bright and how yellow that bill is is probably an indication of health and so to attract a potential mate. And these birds, if you're like driving around Shelby Farms, um, especially like now until the fall and you see these large flocks of blackbirds, a lot of times they're starlings um, or a bird called a grackle, but there are a lot of times these blackbirds um, all together. And a lot of times first year birds will kind of get in these like uh, juvenile gangs um, where they'll all kind of hang out together and feed together and that's a lot of times what you're seeing. Northern Cardinal, this is a pretty um, common backyard bird that most people know, um, but uh, this is one bird that when you first see, especially the female through binoculars, um, it's like, oh, I never really paid attention to that bird. Um, they're one of, to me, one of the, uh, the most attractive birds. It's like somebody just kind of lightly dabbed them with a, a paintbrush with red on them. And um, so they're really interesting to see. The bill color too, um, if you see a bird that looks like a um, female cardinal like this one, but its bill is black, that is a first year bird. So a bird that's just left the nest, just um, flying its first um, summer, uh, things like that. And it takes them about a year for them to change their color. When you start to, if you wanna learn birds and, and sounds are really intimidating, they definitely intimidated me when I first started birding. Um, there's actually a way that I found is helpful and that is to learn kind of some of those common backyard sounds and then you can start to pull those out. And the cardinal is one that I always recommend as one of those common sounds, one of the first sounds you should learn. And it sounds to me like um, somebody dribbling a basketball. So let me play that for you and see if that makes a little bit more sense. Right, kind of like bouncing a basketball. Okay. Oh, that's not that. Okay. Um, all right. So, bluebird. Um, so, the bluebird of happiness. Right. This is a bird that a lot of people want to attract to your to their yard. You can attract them to your yard. I've had had them in my yard before, and I live in um, I live right near Lichterman Nature Center in a in a neighborhood. Um, but with, uh, if you want them to nest there, you really have to have the right habitat. And for that, it's mainly open space. So if you have like a field um, or you live like um, on the edge of a field, those are the places that bluebirds are going to nest. They want an open area to kind of hunt. And they are mainly insect eaters as well. And this is their kind of cheerful song. And I will tell you um, real quick about the bluebirds too. If you can put, if you have the right habitat and you can attract bluebirds, and there is a way to attract them to feeders as well, um, you'll have bluebirds come back year after year. When I first started at Lichterman about six years ago, we um, put up some bluebird boxes. I think my first, my first year there, and we would see bluebirds occasionally. But now we have a number of different pairs that um, will nest in our bluebird boxes. And this year so far, I just had another batch. We're on our second brood or our second, they've already had one batch of babies. Now they're working on their second batch. And so we've had about 12 from the few boxes that we have around uh, Lichterman. So if you have the property to do it, I'm um, definitely put up some bluebird boxes.
American Robin, we kind of mentioned these guys before as another common bird. Most of the time they don't visit feeders, but I occasionally they will come to suet feeders. And it's kind of comical to watch them because they're not used to like going to feeders, used to feeding on the ground, going after worms, things like that. So they're kind of funny, they're a little awkward when they visit the feeder, but I have them come to some of my suet feeders. Downy woodpeckers, um, this is the most, probably the most common uh, woodpecker species that we have that visits feeders. Um, only the males have red, a uh, red patch, but I should change that because actually the young, the first year birds, so birds that maybe just hatched out around now or a few weeks ago, they actually also have a red patch. And the reason for that is probably to deter adult males um, or to, to kind of protect them a little bit more. So it seems like, oh, this is another adult male. I'm gonna, you know, stay away from him. But when in actuality, they're young, young ones. So if you see kind of a dirtier, dingy, downy woodpecker um, that has red on it, a lot of times that's gonna be a first year bird. Just their sound real quick. Let's see. Okay, so maybe you've heard that around your house. The other woodpecker that is your feeder is a red-bellied woodpecker. Now I know this name sounds a little interesting because it does not appear that they have a red belly, um, but they do. And, and the reason that they got the name red-bellied woodpecker is when um, back like in Audubon's time, when they were identifying birds, they would identify birds in hand. And the way they would do that is they typically would shoot a bird, okay? So then they could collect the bird. Um, Audubon, that's how he painted all of his birds. That's why if you see Audubon prints, they're kind of posed in like little awkward positions because he was posing dead birds. But if you have this bird, it didn't necessarily have to be dead, but if you have this bird in your hand and you blew on its belly, you would see underneath here um, some red feathers. And so that's how they get the name red belly woodpecker. Another interesting thing to look, look, uh, something to look at if you see this bird at your feeder is look to see how far the red extends um, up its head. If it goes all the way to its bill, that's gonna be a male red belly woodpecker. If it um, stops kind of right at the, after the nape of the neck, then it's gonna be the female. Um, now, a lot of people call this a red headed woodpecker which kind of makes sense, but there is another woodpecker we have in the area called a red-headed woodpecker, and that's this bird here. Its entire head is a bright, bright red, I mean, it's kind of contrasting black and white. So it's not, it is in this area, it's not as common to see this bird as the red belly woodpecker, but they are in the area. Blue jays, um, these guys are kind of like, I call them the neighborhood watch because a lot of times if you stop and you listen to where they're at and then you watch, you'll see they kind of set up different stations in an area to look out for predators. Um, and probably, to, maybe for other things, but probably looking for predators is one of the biggest things. And they also will imitate a red-shouldered hawk um, call. And so some people think that's to scare away other birds from potential food sites they wanna be at. Um, so pretty interesting birds and they're related to crows. So as birds go fairly intelligent. Mockingbirds, I know a lot of people don't necessarily like mockingbirds, especially during the breeding season because they're really territorial. So if you've had a mockingbird nesting in your yard, um, you probably have a story or two of it uh, kind of coming after you. And um, that's kind of typical of them. They are very territorial, especially during the breeding season, but they are a state bird. Um, they can be pretty interesting to watch and they're what we call a mimic and so they actually instead of having their own unique sound they imitate the sound of other birds and the larger their repertoire or the more songs that they know tends to make them more attractive as a potential mate. Cooper's hawk, I think I mentioned this one earlier, I saw one, saw one this morning going after blue jays. Um, morning doves are a big uh, favorite of Cooper's hawks. They're typically on the ground. They're bigger birds. They move a little bit slower, um, but they go after kind of, um, they're looking for a little bit bigger of a bird, so they're not typically going after something like a hummingbird, um, but they are in suburban neighborhoods and they're bird eating birds. So some of our larger birds, raptors, are going to be eating um, rodents and snakes, but Cooper's hawks specialize in eating other birds. And um, they typically have a longer tail. And um, like I said, 
a lot of people, well, I'll talk about this, how to unwanted visitors, things like that. But um, Cooper socks are just part kind of of the food chain. And so they're helping to maintain populations as well. So seeing these, they're not going to decimate your bird populations. Um, so it, it's just kind of interesting to see them around as well. White-throated sparrow, I mentioned this one, just a wintertime bird, but fairly common in the wintertime if you feed birds a lot of times on the ground and in groups. And they have a pretty unique sound that to me is like the sound of winter here in the Mid-South. And it sounds like they're saying, old Sam, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. Um, I tell this kind of, um, I think it's a funny story, maybe other people don't, um, but I tell this funny story. I went to a um, birding camp in Maine years and years ago and I met um, Ken Kaufman who has written a number of famous um, field guides. And in his early editions, um, the sound of a white-throated sparrow, I think says, um, oh, sweet Caroline, Caroline, Caroline. Well, that was the name of his wife that he later divorced and then he remarried. And so in his later editions of the book, it's no longer Caroline. And I might be switching these, it's no longer Caroline, but it's the name of his new wife. So, and he told that story. So I feel like I can continue to spread that story, but um, just kind of an interesting uh, side story about white-throated sparrows. Dark-eyed juncos, this is another common winter bird that you're gonna see on the ground. And um, typically the females are a little bit uh, lighter in color and the males are gonna be a little bit darker. But just in the winter time, you're not gonna be seeing these birds right now or like up in Alaska and Northern Canada. Ruby-throated hummingbird, this is um, a bird that a lot of gardeners want to attract and um, they're really fun birds to watch. They start arriving back in the Mid-South in April and they're typically gone by October. And like I mentioned before, it's the only common hummingbird east of the Rockies. Um, there are a few weird ones that show up, especially in the winter time, um, but most of the birds that we're seeing in our backyard are ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, the females don't have that ruby throat, but if you happen to see, especially like starting in August and into September, if you see what looks to be a female, but she's got just a couple little red feathers there, that's usually a first year male. So their first year, they get just a couple of the red feathers on their throat. In addition to nectar, they actually will eat small insects too. It makes up a large part of their diet. And so one of the ways we're gonna talk about um, attracting a lot of birds is by attracting insects. Um, so that leads me to how to attract birds to your yard. So the first thing I always like to talk to people, whether it's attracting birds or any type of wildlife, is you wanna think a little bit bigger than just what feeder am I gonna put up or what um, plants am I gonna put in there? Because you wanna think about creating a habitat and that's what's gonna get the birds to really stick around in your yard and to keep coming back um, if you provide them with a quality habitat. And basically the things that make up a quality habitat are the things that we need, the things that all life needs. And that's gonna be water, um, cover or shelter um, from not only predators, but also from inclement weather. You think about, you know, earlier today, we were talking about how bad it was storming. Well, think if you had to be outside during that all the time, where are you going to go to be protected from that? And that's what birds have to do um, on a regular basis. Space for raising young, and then also food, which is the big one that's kind of the exciting one, like what are we going to plant to attract more birds? Uh, but we'll go through the other ones pretty quick and we'll get to that fun stuff. So water, um, water is a really good uh, addition to your backyard um, habitat because birds that don't typically visit uh, feeders are going to come to water. And it's really important in the summer when it's really hot and then also in the winter time, which a lot of people forget about, but when we get really cold temperatures, there's not a lot of unfrozen shallow water for birds to go to. So providing water in the winter time is really important too. Birds are also attracted to the sound of water. So if you can get something like a dripper, or they also make something called a wiggler that'll kind of wiggle your water, not only will it help with keeping mosquitoes away, but it's gonna attract birds as well. If you're really into hummingbirds and you wanna attract them with water, um, you need a mister. Birds don't, uh, hummingbirds don't visit bird feet, um, bird baths, but they do visit um, light mists and so sometimes after a light rain or even during a light rain, you'll see hummingbirds darting through there um, on occasion if you're watering your garden. Um, sometimes you might see a hummingbird um, dart in and out of your um, spray because that's actually how they get water. 
Okay, so the next thing is shelter or cover. And so this isn't gonna be things like planting. So planting like a cedar tree, that's gonna be what's gonna, the birds are gonna go to during inclement weather. And then also during the winter time when it gets really cold, um, they'll huddle together sometimes in the interior of a tree like that. Um, use native plantings whenever possible. We'll talk a lot more about native plants in a minute. Um, but also things like um, roosting boxes, which is this here. It's not a nesting box. It's actually a roosting box. Usually they have entrances on the bottom. Um, although with this roosting box, I don't recommend putting it on a tree like, um, like what's here. Uh, predators can get up trees just as easily um, to get into roosting boxes. So we'll talk a little bit about predator guards and how to mount bird feeders. And then brush piles. This is one thing that a lot of people don't put in their yards, but it's actually really beneficial to um, birds. And that's like a snag pile or when you're cutting those limbs down and building something kind of in the back corner of your yard, it's going to give them shelter. Um, I have one not, it may be 12 to 15 feet from my bird feeders. And a lot of times the birds are kind of back and forth in between the snag pile and then up to the feeders. So you wanna give them space to raise young too. So that could be something as simple as nest boxes. Um, if you, um, you know, we talked about bluebirds and having the right habitat. Um, and with nest boxes, you definitely wanna put on predator guards. So something to keep things like raccoons and snakes out of the bird box. And then also looking at the correct dimensions. So um, with the bluebird, I think it's around like an inch and a half hole, and that's gonna exclude um, starlings, which will outcompete them. Um, so making sure you're doing the right dimensions for the right type of bird and then also doing certain plantings, you know, if, if you've had a, um, if you do hanging baskets, you probably have a story about a bird nesting in there at least once. Um, and then also shrubs and trees are going to provide nesting areas as well. So food, the really fun part, right? So what are those plants that you want to have in your yard that are going to help attract um, different birds? And one of the big things, and I know some people are not big fans of insects, but one of the big things and the reasons that you're going to be planting some of these is to attract a lot of insects. And the reason that we want to attract a lot of insects, well, first native plants. So we'll talk about native plants. That's what I recommend planting to attract birds. Um, there are some uh, exotics and ornamentals out there, but most of the time the birds are actually prefer the native plants to this region. So native plants are adapted to our regional climates, and I'm sure you guys have heard lots about native plants, um, but uh, they need less, typically they need less care than non-natives, especially if you put them in the right spot. So things like um, they need less water once they're established. Now, if we're in a drought, you probably want to water your native plants too, um, but they require less uh, water, uh, less pesticides, and less fertilizers. And they're also going to attract insects. So um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the book, um, Bringing Nature Home. And one of the big takeaways from that is, um, and this is directly from his book, is that native insects evolved to feed on native plants. And most backyard birds raise their young on insects. So the more insects you can attract, the more birds you're gonna attract. And just to drive that home, this statistic is kind of staggering, I think, but it's 90% of terrestrial North American birds raise their young on insects. Even those birds we think of as typical seed eaters, like our sparrows, when they have young back in the nest, they're going to get a lot of insects. So you'll still see them coming um, to your bird feeder sometimes, but what they're taking back to the nest is not seeds, but it's insects. And um, this little bird here is our Carolina chickadee. And they did a study um, and it took 9,000 caterpillars um, to raise a clutch of chickadees. So that's like four or five chickadees um, with two parents feeding them. And they found that it took about 9,000 caterpillars to raise those chicks from hatching until what we call fledging or when they leave the nest. And that was all within like um, 50 meters was kind of the distance that they uh, looked at. And that's basically your backyard. So I thought I was like, oh my gosh, am I providing 9,000 insects um, for, to raise a clutch of chickadees? If you have nesting chickadees in your yard, then you're doing a great job providing food. Um, so what we wanna look at is, well, how do we get to those 9,000 caterpillars? Now it's not gonna be all caterpillars, but that's kind of like the baseline you wanna look at. And how are we gonna get all of these caterpillars in our yard to attract these birds? 
And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to plant native plants. Now, I'm sure a lot of you guys already have native plants in your yard. And so you're probably, you know, you're already attracting birds. And to me, any native plant is really going to have some sort of benefit for birds, whether it's providing direct food, providing more insects, shelter or cover. There's even, you know, milkweeds, which you don't think of as like a bird attracting plant. Um, some birds use the fibers from the milkweed plant and also the um, little tufts that are on the seeds. They use those for nesting materials. So really any nest, any native plant is going to benefit birds. And so it was hard for me to kind of get this list narrowed down. So I just picked a few of my favorites. But really what you want to look at, if you want to plant um, stuff for birds, look at what, first, what do you want, right? Because you don't want to plant a tree when you only have a few feet or if it's, it's right under the power line. So you want to look at what spot do you want to use? Just like if you were going to plant anything, what spot are you going to use? How much space do you have? And what plant is going to work there for what you want in the space that you have? So that being said, I'm just going to give you some examples of some plants, um, but there's a lot of plants out there that are going to work to attract birds. And the biggest one is actually trees. And this is what kind of um, bringing nature home, what Doug Tallamy's book really talks about. Um, and his number one uh, producer basically are the oak trees. They found that an oak tree can support over 500 species of caterpillars. So this is a good start to get to our 9,000 caterpillars because it's 5,000 species, not individual caterpillars they were finding on these trees. So if you think about caterpillars, um, how many uh, caterpillars are laid at one time, it's not just one or two that can be you know, in the hundreds. So that is a really good start. So the oaks or any, really a lot of your big trees are gonna be attracting a lot of these insects, especially caterpillars. Um, so, and they also provide shelter, so you can get nesting birds in there as well. I had actually blue jays nesting in my willow oak out front this year. And cherries and plums are, are right below that species of caterpillars, right at 450. And then dogwoods, and one of my favorite trees of the Mid-South um, is a fringe tree, a white fringe tree. Um, these, if you have the male and the female, you can get them to produce a fruit. And the catbirds and mockingbirds and robins go crazy in the fall for the fringe tree. Um, and that's one of my favorite trees I have in my backyard. And it's just, it smells really good and it's really pretty in the spring. And then we get some birds coming to it um, later in the fall. This is one of the birds I actually saw this year in my willow tree. This is not a bird that you're going to see at your feeders. This is a um, black-throated green warbler. This is one of those what they call a neotropical migrant. It's um, spending its uh, summer, or its breeding up in probably northern um, North America and then it's wintering somewhere down in South America. And I saw it here, like I said, I don't live on a farm. I don't have a lot of land, but this is a bird I saw in my um, willow oak uh, this spring. And then we also saw this one, which is a yellow-throated warbler. And this is just a bird that just passes through. And so not only is it important to provide food for our, our resident birds and the birds that are breeding here, but also that kind of migration time where birds need to really refuel for that big flight. Um, that's when you really want to be providing a lot of um, food for the birds. Uh, the purple martins, if you're if you know purple martins, um, one of the one of the trees that they use is a cherry tree. Now, not for nesting and not for food, but they'll take the leaves and line their nest with it right at the end after they're done building their nest before they lay the eggs. And they think that the cherry leaves actually provide like a natural insecticide to keep some of the insects low in the nest. And then they'll also cover the nest when they leave the nest, they'll cover the eggs with those cherry leaves too. So Eastern red cedar is another tree. I think I mentioned it before. This is one of kind of the most attractive birds. Um, a lot of people think here in this area and the, that's a cedar waxwing. And this one down here, you'll see it's got, this is actually little wax down here that they produce. And then they'll also get red right here as well. And so the red cedar um, pr provides shelter and food for birds. Shrubs, one of my favorites, is not necessarily attracting a lot of birds to eat what the, tree or what the shrub produces, but it attracts a lot of insects, especially pollinators and especially butterflies. Um, so it has this really interesting um, flower head on it that's fragrant and it's very adaptable too, which is what, why I like to recommend this shrub to people. It, if you find it just growing wild, it's going to be stream banks and wet areas. 
Um, but it does fine in dry areas. It does okay in part shade or full sun. So really adaptable shrub and um, attracts a lot of pollinators. So getting all those insects to attract those birds. Elderberry, I know a lot of people aren't big fans of elderberry, but they are really beneficial to birds, especially once they start to produce their fruit. Um, so when they have the flowers, a lot of insects are attracted to that. And then the fruit, a lot of birds are attracted to that. Um, this is a bird called a red-eyed vireo um, that will come down to elderberry fruits. And then another one is a brown thrasher. This is definitely a bird that you can get in your backyard and they're ground birds. And a lot of times they're flipping over leaves. Um, they're larger birds, they're a little bit larger than a robin, um, but they'll also go to the elderberries as well. So we have, uh, interesting, we have a, a pair of um, brown thrashers that's been in our yard for a couple years. And the reason we know that is one of them has um, kind of a messed up wing. Um, and so we can kind of identify them and they're, they're pretty interesting birds, have a lot of personality. And a lot of times you're gonna see them on the ground. Elderberries too can handle like a lot of like um, um, maintenance or trimming them back kind of to get them to go or grow where you want. Um, so that's a really good one and really easy to grow too. Possum haul or deciduous holly. Um, this is a really good one to provide food and really any of the um, any of the hollies are gonna uh, gonna be good for providing food. The, the berries are um, one of the things that are around in the late fall and winter. And so the wax wings, sometime between November and February, there's two possum halls outside of my building at Lichterman Nature Center. And somewhere between November and February, the cedar wax wings come in mass and they'll clear it out, the, the entire, both the trees in just a matter of a couple of days. And it's really entertaining to watch to all these cedar wax wings right outside. Mockingbirds too, our state bird here loves those berries as well. It tries to protect them from all the cedar waxwings, but eventually the cedar waxwings outnumber the mockingbird. And don't forget about vines. So vines are gonna be providing kind of this vertical space for birds to um, get shelter, um, but also it can provide some food. So two of those that I really like are the trumpet honeysuckle. It's like designed perfectly for that long tongue of a hummingbird. And then Virginia creeper. Um, the fruit that they produce actually attracts a number of different birds, including bluebirds and woodpeckers. And I wouldn't believe woodpeckers until I actually saw it. And this one woodpecker almost every day for about a week was going and eating all these um, berries off of the Virginia creeper. So, and great fall color too, if, if you weren't um, familiar with that one either. Coneflowers and sunflowers, and really in the asters too, I should include in that. Um, but they're going to be attracting insects and the insect eating birds um, that are really important. And if you've ever seen a goldfinch on a sunflower, um, it's really just fun to watch, especially when the sunflower kind of bends over with the weight of the, the goldfinch. Um, but pearl coneflower is a great one. It's, it's great, um, easy to grow and attracts a number of different insects, especially the butterflies. And then narrow leaf sunflower is just an example of one of the sunflowers that you can plant, but there's a number of different sunflowers out there. Native sunflowers um, actually are, you know, of course gonna do um, best here as well. Um, so goldfinches of course love the coneflowers and sunflowers. And then this is an Eastern Phoebe. So he says his name, Phoebe, Phoebe. And these guys um, are going after a lot of insects. So a lot of times this bird is, finds a really good perch, goes down and gets insects and kind of returns to that same perch. Grasses, a lot of people forget about grasses, but grasses provide actually a lot of food for birds. And so that's for our seed eating birds and also for ground cover. And so some of my favorites are switchgrass, um, little blue stem, and uh, roots, which are really cool. And it's um, these seed heads right here, the, the birds really go after. And then hummingbirds, right? So when you hear about hummingbirds, everyone always says red or orange, plant red or orange, and that's gonna attract your hummingbirds. And that's absolutely true. And that's kind of their preference, um, but they're, they'll go to other color plants as well. So just this year, I have a patch of um, wild bergamot outside of, or near my um, hummingbird feeder, and he hits those first, and then he goes to the um, hummingbird feeder. If you're familiar with um, blue star, it's uh, Amsonia, Eastern blue star, I'm not sure about the species, um, what the species of that one is, but it blooms early in the spring. And it's one of the few things in addition to buckeyes that's blooming when the hummingbirds arrive and they go to my blue star, I have a big patch of it and they, they hit that every spring. 
Uh, I like to mention columbine too because it's a plant that does well in the shade and so there are plants um, that you can put in the shade to attract hummingbirds. It just doesn't have to be the bright bright red full sun plants like the cardinal flower, which is a great, great plant, but not everybody has full sun everywhere in their yard. So where can you get some of these plants? Well, hopefully at Lichterman, um, uh, there's talk of doing a fall plant sale, um, potentially in October. So just check out our website for more information. Um, if that does happen, all the information will be listed there. Um, and then a lot of the other, um, the Botanic Garden and Dixon, um, they also do a lot of, um, they'll have a lot of native plants in, on their sales as well. So real quick, I want to touch on, I know I'm running out of time here, I want to touch on bird feeders um, because this is definitely a way if you've got all those plants and you still want to get more birds, um, putting up supplemental feeders or bird feeders is going to be a way to attract a lot of additional birds. There's so many different styles out there um, that really it's, it's to your preference, um, but there's a couple recommendations I have for bird feeders. The first one is what sort of seed are you going to use? And there's different seeds to attract different birds. I recommend getting a quality seed. So um, Wild Birds Unlimited um, doesn't have any what we call fillers. If you go to like a big box store or even a grocery store and you buy the mixed wild bird seed, that has a lot of these what we call filler seeds. So the um, millets and milo and oats most birds don't eat those seeds and they actually just kick them out of your bird feeder. And so um, not only will it, are they not eating it, so you're kind of wasting money, um, but it'll start to grow under your bird feeder. Um, so if you invest in a higher quality seed, it might be a little bit more expensive, but in the long run, um, the, everything that you put in there is getting eaten. So if you're just getting started, the two kind of best bang for your buck is going to be um, one of the uh, sunflower seeds, whether that's the striped or the black oil. I find black oil is a little bit more readily available and a little bit less expensive, but any of them will work and then suet. And so there's a lot of um, suet recipes out there. I make a lot of my own suet um, with beef fat, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, and there's definitely a lot on the market right now too. Look for no melt ones and, and again, a higher quality one too. Um, I have about, I maintain about five seed feeders um, at my house and I always have my black oil sunflower seed in one and suet in another one. And then I kind of rotate through a few other things. Um, I, I do a mix, actually my black oil is mixed with safflower seed. Um, I sometimes do whole peanuts, sometimes the shelled peanuts, um, and sometimes different blocks or um, some of the uh, different, uh, more, more intense types of feed if you're really getting into birds that they have. Um, so for a few tips for bird feeding, make sure you have baffles or predator guards that's going to keep squirrels and raccoons from taking your feeders um, or eating all the seed from your feeder. Um, Invest in quality seed and make sure seed storage too. You don't want to get um, uh, flower moss in your bird seed. Um, that'll kind of ruin, uh, you'll get a bunch of flower moss in there. So um, airtight storage if possible or something with a lid and protect it from the rain so you're not getting mold. Um, occasionally clean your feeders in the area underneath your feeders um, just to get rid of some of those shells. And you want to have it kind of close to cover, but not close enough to where like a squirrel can jump to it. So you want to have like eight to 10 feet from a tree or a shrub, um, which could also hide potential predators. And if you can use a pole system, those work really well because if it's not, if you need to move it or if you want to change your style of feeder, the pole systems usually work pretty well. Unwanted visitors. So if you have some unwanted visitors coming to your bird um, feeders like raccoons, there's a few things that you can do. Raccoons are, are probably the toughest to combat because they're fairly smart animals and they can um, be kind of cunning. Um, if I have raccoons, I typically bring my feeders in at night. Um, or there are some larger baffles that can deter them, um, but you have to get a really large baffle. It's a little bit bigger than a squirrel baffle. Rats, um, sometimes rats are able to climb up the poles and get around your baffles. Um, typically, I take, uh, if rats are an issue, I tell people to take their um, feeders down for about two weeks um, and see if that doesn't help. There's also, you can put in cayenne pepper. You can buy commercially bird seed that already has the cayenne pepper in it, or you can actually just add your own. Uh, mammals can taste cayenne pepper, but birds can't. So squirrels, raccoons, and rats are going to be deterred by the cayenne, but the birds aren't.
um, squirrels baffles and um, top baffles like this and bottom baffles like this will typically get the squirrels out um, of your feeder. But if not, um, one of the things that uh, sometimes works is just putting a feeder out for the squirrels, usually with like cracked corn or peanuts. And a lot of times they'll leave the other feeders alone if they have easy access to another one. Um, hawks are just going to be part of the bird feeding game. And so they're just attracted to the birds coming to your feeder, but they're not going to decimate your bird populations. It's just kind of, it happens in nature. They've got young back in the nest that they've got to feed as well. Um, Non-native species, um, oh, I mentioned this with the house sparrows. Feeding a quality seed um, typically gets the um, house sparrows, um, they like some of that kind of more wasty seed. And so feeding a better quality um, seed is going to help with that as well. So just an overview, um, when you want to attract birds, think a little bit more than just putting up bird feeders, but think of creating a habitat. Um, don't forget about the native plants. I don't know if I stress that enough, um, but native plants are definitely going to help with your um, bird habitat. Um, predator guards for feeders. Um, keep cats indoors. That's, um, I know that's a little touchy for some people, but there's more and more studies that they're doing that are showing that cats are killing billions with a B of birds each year. Um, and a lot of the, you know, not necessarily feral cats, but a lot of domesticated cats that are getting plenty of food back at home um, aren't even eating the birds, but maybe just bringing them back to you or something like that. So um, if you can keep cats indoors, um, that's going to really help protect birds as well. And enjoy it. So when you're attracting birds, um, especially during this time, it's um, sometimes better than TV or movie is just to see what birds are visiting your feeder and um, they can be pretty entertaining as well. And lastly, any additional information, um, if I don't Kind of answer your question or you later think of some additional questions. There's my contact information at Lichterman Nature Center. We are open right now, so um, if you want to walk the grounds, feel free. We're open 11 to 3 um, and 11 to 4 on Fridays and Saturdays. So I'm in the Backyard Wildlife Center. If you want to come by and see me, I'm there most days. The National Audubon Society, they actually have a whole section on planting for birds. Um, Cornell Lab, if you want to learn more about birds and what was that bird sound that you heard, that's a great website. Um, and then Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is a great resource for native plants. And with that, I will leave you with one of my favorite cartoons, um, birds talking about bird watchers. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there are some questions. So Mary, there were about three questions there. Uh, okay. The first one was how can I keep snakes away? Okay, so that's a great question and definitely can be an issue um, coming into your um, bird boxes. Um, so one of the things you wanna do is, is you can put a predator guard on that. Now predator guards for snakes, um, sometimes the, so when I talk, I see the other question is um, about what is a predator guard. And so the predator guards are, if you look at the pictures of the feeders, which let's see, I can get back to that. Um, it's kind of that black, um, almost stove piping that's under the feeder. And that's gonna basically block the snakes from being able to get up to your bluebird box. If you have your bluebird box on a tree, um, you might wanna think about posting, putting on, on a post because the snakes can climb the tree and there's not necessarily a baffle you can put around an entire tree. So try moving that to a pole and putting a predator guard on that. And let me um, share my screen again real quick and I'll show you um, what those uh, predator guards look like. I'll get to that real quick. Let's see here real quick. Okay, so this down here, this black part right here is a predator guard. And so this is a, to keep squirrels um, and snakes away from bird feeders or bird boxes. And then sometimes you'll see kind of, um, I talked about baffles too, and those are a little bit different than predator guards, um, but baffles are gonna be something like um, you can put on top of some feeders and that's gonna keep squirrels away from it too. Um, these predator guards, um, 
Mainly you can, they're made um, to fit certain pull systems. You can make your own predator guards. So if you go to like a Home Depot or a Lowe's and they have like, um, I think it's called stove, stove piping. It's like a flexible metal sort of thing. And you can make your own baffle kind of like a cone um, that fits over. Cause depending if you don't have a pole, if you just have it on a piece of wood or um, something that doesn't quite fit the typical baffle, you can make them um, out of that um, stove piping. I think it's called, it's flexible um, metal, she metal sheeting and just fasten those together kind of like in a big cone. And that should help um, keep predators off there as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. Well, let me get here. Uh, okay. Predator guards. Squirrels love my bird feeders. Any solutions? A couple solutions for squirrels. Um, you can try some of the hot pepper mixes or put in a hot pepper yourself. Um, see how they're getting on to your feeders. If they're jumping from a tree, um, you'll probably want to move your feeder because even putting a bottom predator guard um, uh, is not going to help if they're coming from the top. So um, see if they're coming from a tree, where they're coming from. Um, try If they're just climbing up your pole, try a um, predator guard or baffle like we talked about. And there's a couple of different styles out there as well. Um, but that should help with the um, squirrels. Um, oh, you have all types of deterrents. I see that. So, if, uh, so try the red pepper. Um, the other thing to do is there are some seeds that the squirrels don't prefer as much, something like safflower, um, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time for the birds to uh, get used to that. But see how the bird or see how the squirrels are getting on your feeder and then kind of um, go from there. Um, dried mealworms. Dried mealworms are great and they are, they will attract bluebirds to your feeder. Um, I've had bluebirds come to my suet that um, they sell these kind of cylinder blocks um, that have mealworms in it um, and then they sell just the regular dried mealworms and that's the way to get bluebirds to come to your feeders absolutely the mealworms you can do live mealworms too but sometimes they get out and the dried mealworms seem to work really well too um will this presentation be online um it i don't have it online at this point, but if there's um, certain information that you're looking for, just feel free to email me or I can email it individually if people would like that presentation. Um, oh, Pam on the poles. Yeah, so the, the Pam on the poles will definitely help because the squirrels can't grip to that. Um, but like you said, you have to reapply it. So um, if you don't want to continue with the Pam or some people use Vaseline, you can try a predator um, guard too on, on your pole to stop them from doing that. There's also some really um, interesting bird feeders. Um, oh, I should mention there, there uh, to the person that has basically tried everything for squirrels. There is a bird feeder out there um, that is, uh, I'm trying to think of the, it, it's a squirrel deterrent bird feeder. And basically what it is, is it's um, the opening is weighted. So if a squirrel, or you can even set it for like a large, if a larger bird, like a grackle got on your bird feeder, it closes the seeds. Um, and so I put that up and I, I was a little hesitant. I was like, oh, I don't know, is this really going to work? Because they are a little bit more expensive. I've never had a squirrel get a seed out of that type of um, feeder. So it's a, um, uh, if you're interested, email me and I can, I can think of the exact name, but um, Wild Birds Unlimited carries them and they work. Um, but they are a little bit more expensive. Um, I, I I think the smaller one is like around 40 to $45, but they work. I've never had a squirrel get a seed out of that feeder. Can I say something? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, it's called a squirrel buster. That's it. I have yeah. two of them and I recommend if you have trees like I do, get the longer, the larger one, pay more money because yeah. they work. I have two of them and the squirrels are not long enough to hang down to put, to keep, if they press on the ring, it's weighted, they can't get it. Yep, that's absolutely right. And that's the one, the one regret I have is that I bought the smaller one, but my next bird um, uh, feeder purchase is going to be the bigger one because okay. they, they do work. And, and I've tried a lot of things before too, but they absolutely work. Okay. At this time, at, at this time, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to thank Mary for her presentation. And this will be online for anybody who would like a repaint. So thank you very much, Mary. It was a wonderful presentation.
Thank you guys so okay. much for having me. Uh, so we're going to uh, go into the treasurer's report portion of our meeting.